understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And he answered me and said, The thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which ye should do. And when we departed from Oreb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, which ye saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well. And I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe. And they turned and went up into the mountain, and came unto the valley of Eshcol, and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down unto us, and brought us word again, and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee, as a man doth bear his son, in all the way that ye went, until ye came into this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you, to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, in fire by night, to show you by what way ye should go, and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and was wroth, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, which he said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn you, and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight, according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had girded on every man his weapons of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously up into the hill. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you, and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormah. And ye returned and wept before the Lord. But the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. So ye abode in Kadesh many days.
according unto the days that ye abode there. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. You draw me to us a high view. We turned and took our journey the into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. The name implies the, the, the second reading of the law. In other words, the law was first uh, given to them at Mount Sinai, and now at Kadesh Barnea in Horeb, we see that the law is being read again. Why? Because there were two generations of people over those 40 years that came out of Egypt. They came to the Mount Sinai and encamped there for a full year. God instructed them in everything that they needed to do. But at some point in time, as you see it here in Deuteronomy chapter one, which by the way, is a rehearsal of the history of the children of Israel's journey from uh, Sinai to the point where they're about to cross the promised land. And to keep it in some kind of perspective so that you can understand it, you have to understand that God is in the process now of causing the children of Israel, that second generation, to enter into the promised land. But in order to enter into the promised land, Moses, who is about to go off the scene here, we'll see that a little bit later in the book of Deuteronomy, but we actually see that Moses here is responsible for charging the children of Israel, that second generation, with the law, not only charging them with it, but explaining it to them and the importance of it. So what happened to that first generation does not happen to them. Amen. And so we can see here that they are, uh, are paused and ready to go over into the promised possession, which is what we call the promised land. And they were initially 11 days journey, 11 days from crossing into the promised land. But because of their unbelief, because of their disobedience, make a note of that, because of their unbelief and their disobedience, it took them 40 years to enter into the promised land. Amen? They started out with one leader. They're going to end up with another leader before they actually cross over. So the emphasis on chapter one in the book of Deuteronomy is Moses is giving a summary, and I encourage you to go back and read that. Moses is giving a summary of the journey of the children of Israel so that you will know that there were two censuses taken, a census when they came out of Egypt, and they will take another census and have taken another census to go into Egypt, I mean, into the promised land. And there were two readings of the law, meaning the Ten Commandments, the one when they came out and another before they go in. And we will see in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28 later on, as they journey actually into the promised land, we'll see the reading of those Ten Commandments again by the princes of the tribe of Israel. I believe Deuteronomy adds more detail, if you will, to our study thus far. We see in the Exodus and the Leviticus and in Numbers, those three books, Deuteronomy puts it all together as a highlight so that if it's your first time reading those particular books and studying those particular books, you can actually get a flavor, if you will, of the journey of the children of Israel and what caused them to be on God's good side or his bad side, so to speak. Amen. Now, here at the beginning, we actually see here in verse one, it says, these are the words which Moses spake unto all of Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness in the plains over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazrock and Diz Dizba. This is a geographical location, in other words, where they actually camped out. In other words, there are settlements on the east side 
And then there's going to be settlements on the west side of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is the river that they have to cross now in order to enter the promised land. To come out of Egypt, to come into the wilderness, they had crossed over the Red Sea. Now they're at a point where they're going to have to cross out of the wilderness into the promised land. These journeys give us as believers insight that number one, the things that were happening with the children of Israel over those particular years, as it said in, in verse two, said there are 11 days journey from Hebron, Horeb by the way of the Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In other words, it was an 11 day journey. Why did it take 40 years? The answer is disobedience, rebellion. And God warns us, he warns us about this. We're going to see this in the New Testament reiterated as well. But here where we have an opportunity to read Moses' uh, report, his summary on the children of Israel, we get to see from his own mouth and his own heart the journey because he was called as God's appointed leader. Amen? In verse 3 again, it says, And it came to pass in the 14th year, in the 11th month of the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all of the Lord that the Lord had given him <clears throat> in commandment unto them. In other words, his job right now, he's, he's, he's up in age. Uh, when he uh, came into this, he had been, he was 80 years old. Now he's over 100 years old. He's getting ready to pass off of the scene. But at the same time, verse 4, that after he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelled in Heshbon and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelled in Astroth and Eldro, on this side of Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law saying, and here's the point that we want to make here, okay? Because all he's doing now is recalling what God has already said. He says on verse five says, on this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law saying, verse six, the Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. In other words, if you go back and you have that map in front of you, and I encourage you to do that. Most Bibles do have a map in front of you. We have one that presented here for you to take a look at. But those maps help you trace this journey, this history of their journey. Now, what's interesting here, we are studying the journey of the children of Israel. But guess what? It mirrors our journey also. What do you mean? Israel, from the time that they came up out of Egypt to the time they crossed over the Jordan, what we're going to see later, they were always in rebellion and stiff neck. They were always in rebellion and stiff neck. In other words, they had to continue to strive with God and to fight their enemies. God does not hide the fact that there were enemies in the area in which they were traveling. But we found out that because of their disobedience, when they refused to cross over in verse 26 through 40 here in chapter one, where he points this out, we find out that God allowed those that were 20 and upward to die off in the land. Amen. And so we encourage you to get a map, lay it out, trace these steps, and you will see in verse 7, it says, turn you and take your journey. And so God now is moving them out. We're not going to cover all 43 verses, 46 verses here uh, tonight because this is a rehearsal. And hopefully, if you've been here, coming here, 
you've already read Deuteronomy chapter one. If not, I encourage you to do that. But we do want to point out a few highlights here for you to understand the whole methodology behind this particular journey. Moses is considered the leader. He is rehearsing the journey. Again, verse seven says, turn you and take your journey and go to the Mount of the Amorites and unto all the places nigh unto, unto the plains in the hills and in the valley and of the south by the seaside to the land of the Canaanites and unto the, to Lebanon and unto the great river, the river Euphrates. If you're looking at a map, you can see, and we have here on the map that we provided you here, you can actually see their journey mapped out here and how God, in a lot of cases, just turned them around in circles and back and forth and what have you. There was rebellion, uprising, grumblings, complainings. All of this took place over these 40 years. But at the same time, what you have to understand, God is keeping what? His word. When we go back to numbers and we see when God refused to allow the, that group, that generation, that first generation to cross over, he swore by his name that they would not enter into his rest. Then we see what happened to that upper generation, the parents, and the parents died off in the wilderness. In other words, they did not see the promised land. Amen. Also, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses will not cross over or be able to cross over into the promised land. Why? Because of disobedience. Disobedience will keep you out of the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Look at verse eight, and I'm going to skip down. Verse eight sums up the summary of Moses's record of the recalling of God's command for them to go forth on this particular journey. Verse eight says, behold, I had set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. In other words, God had already consolidated the promise that he gave over 400 years ago to their forefather, Abraham. In other words, God told Abraham to take a journey out of his land, Ur of Chaldees, and go see a place that I'm going to lay out for you and your seed and your generation afterwards. Then we see 400 some years later, here come Israel out of Egypt, and they now are that generation that God promised to, Mo to Abraham to go in and possess the land that God showed to Abraham. In other words, God is keeping his what? He's keeping his promises. God has not advocated. If God promised you something, he's going to bring it to pass. The thing for us to do is to receive or uh, to hear, receive, and obey. Write that down. To hear, because faith coming by hearing. Amen. And when we are hearing, we are receiving from God. And then when we are loving God we and obeying God, that ensures whatever God's promised us. It's like a formula. If you hear or receive the word of God and you, by loving and obeying, you remember Jesus said, if you, what, love me, you would, what, basically obey me. Amen. Keep keeping the commandments that you're receiving through hearing is loving God. Now, I just showed you the formula. If there's a formula in all of this, as it relates to your faith, that is it. You cannot obey the word of God if you don't hear the word of God. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Now, when you receive the word of God, you need to hold on to the word of God and let the word of God instruct you because Deuteronomy, the law, talks about the teaching, uh, the, the, the teaching of the word of God. In other words, we, they were to obey the law. Amen? The teaching, the doctrines. Amen? 
So when you hear or listen and receive, and when you obey, you show God that you love him. And then whatever God promised you, that's what the promised land is all about. You enter in. And when you enter in, guess what? Through obedience, by that keeping that cycle going, you get to enjoy what God said. Remember, God promised this to Abraham in verse 8. I mean, to Israel, based on the covenant. God is the one that keeps the actual covenant. He's the covenant-keeping God. But he's also the God of laws. So God knows because of the wickedness of man in his heart and his rebellious attitude and his grumbling that the only thing that can sustain him or preserve him, amen, is to, to receive the word of God, to obey the word of God, amen, so that God can do for him or her the things that he has promised to do. I hope that's made uh, clear and simple. Simple, receive the word of God, obey the word of God, and enjoy the word of God. Amen? These are the three things because the land represents what? Possession. So God's grace provided the land. Amen? God's power gave them the ability to possess the land. And God's obeying God's word gave them the ability to enjoy the land. If you think of it like that, amen. So those three things are always important and responsible. And so this lesson, what we can glean from this lesson is those three principles, receiving, obeying, and enjoying what God has promised us. A lot of times people say, I'm blessed, but they're not receiving God's word. They are not obeying God's word. Therefore, they are not enjoying God's word. Even if Israel went into the land, got over the Jordan, went into the land, they would not enjoy their possession if they ceased to obey. That's what the whole book of Judges is about when we get to the book of Judges. They were in the land at that time, but yet they were disobeying. They stopped or they ceased the process. And when you stop and cease the process, then you start experiencing the opposite of the joy of the Lord. Amen? Instead of you start receiving God's wrath. Amen? In verse 9 through 18, and I'm not going to read all of this to you, but I want to point out a couple of things. You notice, there have to be leaders appointed. He said, I, and I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. In other words, Moses is telling the children of Israel, this task is too heavy in order to do it by oneself. Amen? In ministry, it's the same way. You cannot be uh, in ministry a lone ranger. It doesn't work. Amen? You have to have other people, helpers, I call them helpers, to come alongside of you and to help you do what God has given you the burden to do. Keep that in mind. Amen? It's not a one-person show. And we can see this from the what? The journey of Israel from uh, uh, Mount Sinai all the way into the promised land. God has caused them here to what? Appoint leaders. Amen? He says in verse 12, How can I myself alone bear your, your cumbersance and your burdens, and your strife. In other words, those people were like a headache because from morning to night, they were complaining, grumbling. They didn't stop that. They weren't choir, choir boys walking into the promised land, no. They were everyday people just like you and I with all our problems that we come along with. Amen? Everybody has problems. But what we should do is submit whatever we have in prayer to the Lord and let the Lord give us out of his word, the solution. Amen. Not try to handle it on your own. No, don't do that. Amen. And so we can see in verse nine through 18, how leaders were appointed. He said, take you wise men in verse 13. Watch what he says. And we do this today in the church. Amen. We appoint people that uh, the Bible says in Acts 7, Look among you and choose men of good reputation, good report, and place them over the business of the church. 
Amen. It's no different today than it was back then. Look at verse 13. He says, take you wise men and understand and know among you and known among your tribes and with people that you know, and I will make them what? Rulers over you. God is the one that made them rulers. We have to be very careful in putting people in positions that do not, number one, have a reverence for God, number one, or God's people. Very dangerous, very dangerous, amen? Because when they become self-centered versus God-centered, it's gonna cause more strife and more of the same, and God's gonna have to break out on them. So we can see here in these verses, verse nine through 18, make a note of that, that God had to make sure that he put leaders over them. And in verse 18 says, and I command you at that time, all the things which ye should do. In other words, the leaders came with instructions, not just you got a label and that's it. No, leaders have a role. They have instructions and they are to follow those, amen, and instructions. Then he led them into battle. He allowed them once they became numbered and organized and, get, and received all the appointments from the Levites to the rest of the 12 tribes, got all the instructions and everything. Then God allowed them to come to the land of the Amorites. Look at verse 19. He says, and when ye depart from Horeb, we went through all the great and terrible wilderness, which ye saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. In other words, he's telling us that, in verse 20, he said, and I said unto you, ye are come into the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God do give unto us. Remember, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, amen? God owns every square mile of the earth. And he can give it to whomever he chooses. When he came down to Israel, God owned the land. The children of Israel never owned the land. They were asked to go in and possess the land. They do not own it because God is the landlord. Make a note of that. God is the landlord. He is the owner of the land. Amen. We see that in every day. If you got a mortgage, the bank owns your house. If you got you paying rent, the, the, the landlord owns your, your apartment. Amen. Amen. Your name is not on anything other than the monthly payment. Amen. So God has this thing already set up basically the same way. All God is doing is allowing us, the New Testament says, He allowed them to go into the wilderness to try what was in them. We're going to find that scripture for you to try what was in in them. In other words, God had a plan for bringing them the way he brought them. Because when God, when God allows us to go through trials and tribulation, James says, counted what? What? All joy. When you fall into various trials. Why? Because your faith is what's important in this journey. If you don't understand anything else about these lessons that we covered, amen, in these first five books of the Bible, now we're in the fifth book. Understand, it's all about your faith and obedience to God's spoken word. Jesus said in Matthew 4, man should not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You thought he was just talking to the devil? No, he was reiterating everything that God originally intended from the garden to this very day in February of 2022. We are to obey the word of God. So from verse 19 to verse 25, he talks about that journey in that particular area. And Israel's rules from entering to the promised land was given by Moses in verse 26. He said, now withstanding, ye would no, not go up. He, he's talking about the rebellion. He rebelled against the commands of the Lord your God, verse 27. And ye murmured. You see that word murmured? 
in your tents. In other words, they thought nobody was listening to them. You know, a lot of us do the same thing. Nobody's looking. We're not really around anybody else. And But we are complaining. We are talking about people. We are talking about, we're just grumbling. And guess what? Even though nobody else is around, guess what? God hears you. God hears us. Amen? That's not a good thing. Because God uses that little secret uh, 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 murmuring and stuff that we do to chastise us. So be very, very careful. Look at verse 27 again. It says, and ye murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us and he brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. You see that attitude? They don't have a positive attitude. They have a negative attitude. You need to make sure that in a, as a believer that the Bible tells us, amen, to have a positive attitude, amen? It talks about that in Philippians chapter four. Whatsoever things are truth, honest, and so forth, it gives us about six principles to lay our hands on to make sure that we have a positive mental attitude at all times. Why? Because that's important. That's very important. God hates grumblers and murmurers. And that's why he used that episode of their murmuring to wipe them out, to remove them. Why? because God does not want those type of people in the promised land. Amen. In fact, he don't want those type of people even in heaven. Amen. Look at verse 28. Whether we go up, our brothers have discouraged our hearts saying, the people is great and tall than we, and the cities are great and walled it up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the An uh, Anakins there. No, it's the giants. There were giants in the land. So when they came back with those spies, those 10 spies came back with that negative report, they called the entire nation of Israel, all those people, to start complaining. It just takes one complainer. You notice about complainers. Let me say this. Complainers don't complain to themselves alone. They find somebody else to drop their, 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 their garbage off into their ear. And then, then they find somebody to drop that garbage off into their ear. And then after a while, everybody is repeating the same old garbage. In other words, you are saying when you, you, you complain that God is not able to deliver you. Amen? Those giants were no match for God. God is bigger than those giants. He's more powerful than all those giants. So those giants were not a threat to God. Amen? They were just like shaft when God blows on them, they'd be gone away. Amen. So if you make a note of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, and 1 Corinthians 3, 13, as we said earlier about those, those verses, that's what we were talking about. If you go back there and read those verses, just make a note of them and you write it down, that chastisement. Amen. Deuteronomy 8 and 2 and 1 Corinthians 3, 13. And you'll see that it's in the word. It's not just a saying it, it's in the word. Look at verse 28. Whether shall we go up? Our brothers have discouraged our heart. You see that word discourage? That's a tool of the devil. The devil always, if you right now listening to me are discouraged in ministry, the devil ain't got to you. How'd he get to me? You listen to the wrong people instead of listening to God or having a heart after the things of God. Don't let that happen, folks. It can happen to anybody, anywhere, uh, small and great. Doesn't matter. Amen? The people is greater and taller than we. In other words, they put into their imagination, in their mind, not the word of God, but the reality of the situation that was around them. What is that telling you? When you look around you, amen, the things that are passing away and highlight those things and don't highlight the word of God, which is eternal, you're setting yourself up for failure. Don't do that. Amen? Let's move on to the, the latter part here, and that is in uh, 41 through 46 here. We can see Israel decides to enter. In other words, Israel decided, well, you know, uh, we, found, we learned our lesson. Uh, now we're ready to go. Not so fast. So verse 41 
says, then they answered and said unto me, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord, our God commands us. And when ye had got girded up every man his weapons of war, watch what he says, ye were ready to go up to the hill. But look at verse 42. And the Lord said unto me, this is Moses talking, say unto them, go not up, neither fight. Why? For I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemy. Was when God says go, you're supposed to go. Not when you say go. That's a lesson for us. When God told them to go, they didn't want to go. Amen? They messed up. Now they realize their error, and now they're ready to go. But God said, no, no, no. Because if you go, I'm not going to go with you. And if I don't go with you, guess what? You're not going to be successful. That's basically what he's telling them. Amen? Verse 43 says, so I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, again, what? but rebelled against the what? The word of the Lord. The commandment of the Lord is the word of the Lord. See, that when the word of the Lord tells you something or tells us something, and you do the opposite, that's called rebellion. Amen? Rebellion. And rebellion to God is like witchcraft. We found a way around God's word. Be very careful that when you do what you do, you are not rebelling against God. Oh, it's okay to rebel against your enemy and all these other people around you. But when you rebel against the word, the word of God, you're in trouble with God. And when you're in trouble with God, forget all your other enemies. God is the enemy. When he's your enemy, he can get you where no other enemy can reach you. Understand that. Amen? Notice, they rebelled against the commandments of the Lord and went presumptuously, the word presumptuous means that they continue to sin. They continue to not obey up into the hill. Now notice verse 44, it said, and the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chase you as bees do. Uh-huh. And destroyed you in Seir even unto Hormon. In other words, if you go back and look at the history, it's documented. You, you are helpless before your enemies. You have any enemies? You wonder why they seem, seem to get the upper hand all the time? You might want to go check your vertical relationship with God. Amen? Because no weapon formed against you is designed to prosper if this is right. Amen? But when this ain't right, then this is just ripe for your destruction. Amen? We see it right here. God is showing us this. We can study this. We can examine this and see for ourselves what's going on in our own lives. We all have trouble, every last one of us. But make sure your trouble is not with heaven. Amen? Only with man. And God's going to fight all your battles. He's going to destroy all your enemies. All you got to do is continue to receive God's word whenever you're going through financial health situation, relationship situation, just go to the word of God, continue to take the word of God in. And don't just take it in like you're drinking water, but take it in for the purpose of obeying it. And as you obey God's word, God's word will do what? Sustain you. You know, rebellion again is like witchcraft. Make a note in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, 1 Samuel 15, Verse 23 talks about rebellion is just like old witchcraft. Amen? Amen. In verse uh, 45, it says, and you, ye returned and wept before the Lord. You see that? When the last time you came before the Lord, I said, Lord, I need your help. Well, was it because of disobedience that you had to weep before the Lord? Examine yourself, the Bible says, to see whether or not you're in the faith. And you return and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not, watch what he says, when you disobey and make this, make a notation in your notes, when you don't obey God, God will not hear you. He will not hear your prayers either. And we need God to hear all of our prayers. And we definitely need to have a, a place before the Lord where we can pour out our concerns. You mess that up 
when you disobey. Just keep that in mind. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. I wonder why. Because they rebelled. They didn't obey God. God ain't hearing them. They have more to lose than God does. Amen? Why? Because they're in a state of rebellion. Last verse. So ye abode in Kadesh many days, according to the days that ye abode there. He rehearsed, he finished rehearsing here the history of their journey. And now we're going to see that the history had been laid out there for them. This is the new generation. He, he brought them up to speed and what have This is what happened to your parents. Now, if you're not careful when you get ready to go over, this will happen to you. You are to listen and love God. You remember uh, in the commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Why? Because God's going to lay before them. We're going to see this in chapter 27 and 28 of Deuteronomy. You can go check it out tonight if you like. God's going to lay before them both blessing and curses. Okay? Blessings and curses. These blessings and curses are there for a purpose. God ordained them. Let me say it again. Blessings and curses come from God. Blessings and curses come from God as it relates to your obedience. So when you disobey, you get cursed. Remember when Adam and his, and his wife disobeyed in the garden and the serpent disobeyed? What happened to them? Did God have a reward ceremony for them? No. They received not a blessing, but just the opposite. Man now has to work by the sweat of his brow. A woman has to uh, uh, experience pain and childbearing, all that. The serpent was walking upright. Now he got to crawl in the dust. Hey, those are not blessings. Those are not blessings. God wants to bless you, but he blesses you when you obey his word. Turn to Hebrews chapter three, right quick at the closing, before we open up for the answer, a question and answer here. Hebrews chapter three. In other words, when you go to the New Testament, the New Testament, just like Deuteronomy for the church age, summarized the very thing that we are studying here in the first five books of Moses. Amen. So it's no excuse. A lot of people say, that's the Old Testament, ha, 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 blah, blah, blah. And they, and they mess up every time. Because what they don't see here, the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they had something they could not get rid of. They could not get rid of, no matter what. They could not get rid of. What do you think that was? Write it down if you know. You ready? They could not get rid of an evil heart. That's what called them to rebel, to act up, to act out. They may have in their mind say, you know, I'm not going to do that again. Huh. You see how they repented and wanted to go and do the right thing after they rebelled, but God went him. What they did not discover that God already knew that they had a heart of rebellion. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and no man can know it. You got to understand that we all possess a wicked heart. All of us. There's no exception. But God gives us when we born again a new heart. And it's out of that heart and that mind we are to worship and serve the Lord. Amen? He, the Bible says he's not going to give them a, a, a uh, commandments written in stone, but he's going to write his word upon the tables of their heart. And we get that when God gave us Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ made the, the, the ability for us to serve God with a clean heart like David cried out for in Psalm 51 possible. Amen. What do you think called David to do what he did? A wicked heart. Romans 7 verse 21. There's a note. Take a note there, Romans 7, 21. So it's the, we got a heart problem, a heart problem. Amen? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. So even though God can bring him out of Egypt, bring him through the desert, bring him into the promised land, that heart 
that heart became hard-hearted and rebellious. That's why God had to give them those commandments and those laws and those statutes and all of those things so it would keep them from God having to strike out and kill them. Amen? We're not under the law today. We're under grace because of Jesus Christ. Amen? We don't need the Ten Commandments or anything else to regulate us. Why? Because we are able to keep them through our new heart that God has given us. Amen? In closing, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Okay, and I want just I'm gonna read these real quick, but I want you to put them in your notes. Hebrews chapter three, beginning in verse seven, it says, "Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said today, if ye would hear His voice, Amen. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. The provocation is pointing back to the, their journey that Moses covered in Deuteronomy chapter one that we just read." In the days of temptation, where? In the wilderness. This is not in the promised land. When they were going through the wilderness. Verse 8, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the days of temptation in the wilderness. Verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, provoked me, and saw my works. How long? 40 years. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Now I'm going into verse 10. Wherefore, I was grieved. Huh? When we act out like that, God not saying, praise God. Look at, look at my child. No, we are grieving God. We are grieving the Holy Spirit when we act out of our wicked heart. He said, wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err where? 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 In their heart. And they have not what? They have not known my way. Why haven't they not known my way? They have not received my word. See, when you don't receive God's word, you don't know his ways, and you're going to do what's natural, which is act out of a wicked heart. That's how it works, folks. Verse 11, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest notice that god said himself now one of them that had that kind of heart is going to enter into my rest isn't that something my god verse 12 says take heed he's talking to us now take heed brethren lest there be in any of you what an evil heart of what unbelief and departing from the living god no if your evil heart leads you away from god not to god Verse 13, but exalt one another daily while it is called today, and at least any of you be what? Hardened. You see that word hardened? How? Through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is at the core of why our evil hearts rebel. See, our hearts are always following the flesh, our evil hearts, that is. So we, we are in a state of rebellion. When you look at the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, they were rebelling, 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 rebelling. Even when they got in the promised land, they get rebelling, 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 rebelling. They needed a heart transplant. That's what they needed. Amen. Look at verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, that's assurance, steadfast how long? Until the end. We can't wave, in other words, folks. You can't just say, I accept the Lord back in 1999, and on that day, it was a glorious day, and, and ever since then, you've been living like a rebel? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. God got, a, got, God got a program for you. Amen? Why? Because you have received the word of God. Yes, so that means you know it, which means that you're willfully rebelling against him and because you're not obeying. You went from obedience to disobedience. Now God has to do what he got to do. He has to chastise you. Amen? Amen. He said, while he has said, verse 15, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Again, he's pointing back. Verse 16, for some, when they had heard, notice, we have to receive by hearing, right? Did provoke, how be it, 
not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Amen. Verse 17, but with whom was the, he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? Those carcasses, what happened to them? They fell where? They died in the wilderness. He's just telling us. He's telling us. You're not only going to miss your joy, you're probably going to, your life is going to be cut short. Especially children. Obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Amen. If you want to prolong your days, obey. Obey your parents. Obey the word of God. That's what he's talking about. Amen. Verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest. This is the promised land. But to them that believe what? Not. And what they did not receive God's word. And if they received God's word, they didn't obey God's word, which means that they did not love the Lord. So we see that they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. My God. Now, let me read a couple of verses here, and I'm through. In verse four, in chapter four, because he gives us instructions. He does not want to leave us, Hebrews chapter four. He does not want to leave us in the condition that we are in. He always want to get us out of the ditch that we are in. Amen. And then he says in chapter four, verse one, these words, let us therefore fear, least a promise. Remember the promised land? Our faith is guided by the promises of God. Do you have faith toward God? Then can you recount the promises of God? Because God gave us his promises to deliver us. Are you listening? He said, let us therefore fear, least a promise being left us entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to what? Come up short of it. Which means you can do your own self in by not obeying God's word. And you can't turn around and say, like Adam, the woman you gave me. No, Adam, you the one that was in disobedience. So what happened in the garden has also happened in the wilderness. What happened in the garden, God gave Adam his word before they started out. Then when he gave him his word, he didn't obey his word. And then he got put out. Same thing. They came out of the wilderness. God gave them a word. They didn't keep the word. They died in the wilderness. They did not enter in. Amen. So we see a pattern here in the scriptures. Verse two, for unto us, he's talking to us today, church. Unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached, watch this, did not profit them. Why? not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, let me stop there. You can read the rest of that. You have to take the word of God that you hear and mix it with the faith. Faith is instructional. So you hear the word of God, right? And the word of God, when it comes to us, is codified and in the law for us to obey when you obey the word of God, you are showing you have the right kind of faith. Remember, the Bible said the devils, demons have faith, but they tremble. Why? Because they are disobedient. They know they have a judgment coming. They don't obey God's word, even though they may know God's word. Is that you? Amen. So if somebody told you you were going to die today at midnight, would you be ready? You should be ready. Because you know you love God. How do you know you love God? Because you receive God's word and your heart's desire is to obey it. That's the premises right there. If you don't get anything out of the lesson tonight, that is the premise. You must obey the word of God.